Robert Osborne. Thanks so much for joining us tonight as we continue celebrating what would have been Faye Ray's 100th birthday. Now, Faye had one of those long-distance careers that stretched from the 20s to 1980, but we're concentrating on the movies from the best years of her prolific career, the 1930s. Our next film is from 1931. It's called Dirigible, and it was made by Columbia Pictures and directed by the great Frank Capra. Just before Capra began his rise to fame, which made him one of the most revered filmmakers in history. In this movie, Faye Ray is part of a love triangle. Her husband, played by Ralph Graves, is a hotshot Navy pilot who's much keener about making headlines than he is about paying attention to his wife. Meanwhile, Jack Holt is a very dependable, dirigible pilot who gives both aerial and amorous competition to the clueless husband. But the story is actually just a hook on which to hang some really spectacular in-flight sequences as both Ralph Graves and Jack Holt try to reach the South Pole via air. Now, Dirigible was the most expensive movie Columbia Pictures had made up to that time. Studio boss Harry Cohen was determined to have it be a great success, but for more than just financial reasons. At that point, Columbia Studios was a very small upstart company, struggling to attain the big lead status of studios such as MGM and Paramount and United Artists. Capra was still finding his footing as a director, too. He hadn't yet hit his Capra-esque stride. The sign that that was changing, though, came when Dirigible became the first Columbia film to be considered important enough to have its premiere at Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood. And in those days, only the most important films were premiered at Grauman's. Here it is, from 1931, Frank Capra's Dirigible. <laughs> The Admiral will see you now, Commander Braden. Thanks. Excuse me. Oh, hi, Braden. Fine, thank you, Admiral. Braden, is your dirigible in shape to take a good long trip? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Well, Commander, how would you like to take a trip to the South Pole? What? <laughs> Sit down, Braden. Sit down. Think it over. Think it over, sir. Why, I'd give my right eye, my left arm, and both legs to go. Hmm, sounds like you're interested. Uh, Rondell is in town. I suppose you know why. Well, the papers have hinted that he's here to get the Navy to back him on his flight to the South Pole. The papers are right. And the Navy has agreed. That is why I asked you to come to Washington. Oh, uh, have a cigar. Thank you, sir. And you were saying? Now, understand. Rondell has been talking airplanes. Uh, not dirigibles. What do you think? Well, sir, I've spent my whole life with balloons. I know it. And we appreciate your efforts, Braden. But uh, most of this country is from Missouri, as far as dirigibles are concerned. But the planes have had the spotlight. We've never had a chance to demonstrate what lighter than aircraft can do. Exactly. Now, this is your chance. Rondell's idea is to go to the Antarctic by boat and then try to reach the pole in a plane. But that would take a year or more. With my dirigible, I could do it in a month. 
All I'd need to do is to establish fueling stations uh, on the way and, and convince Mr. Rondell. <laughs> Let me at him. Where is he? Just give me an hour of his time. I'll convince him, sir. You shall have a whole day. I'm bringing him up to Lakehurst on Navy Day. The public will be there, Commander. But you're going to put on a show especially for Mr. Rondell. I understand, sir. And if it's a good show, who knows? You may be needing some uh, winter underwear. Just give me a chance to do it, and I'll go in my bathing suit. Good. <laughs> Good. Thank you, sir. commuting to the North and South Pole. He hasn't gotten there yet, but he looks like a persistent old fellow. You know, the order to release those free balloons came from Braden by a radio telephone from the dirigible. Do you mean to say that he can give orders from up there in the dirigible? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh. Why would you like to talk to him a minute? Could I talk to him from here? Why, oh, certainly, certainly. Uh, orderly. Uh, get me uh, Commander Braden on the phone. Aye, aye, sir. Just a minute, sir. No, no. Thank you, thank you. Hello? Commander Braden talking. Oh, how do you do, sir? Oh, I feel lighter than air. Hope we haven't bored you. Commander, I've seen magic in my life, but never anything like this. Thank you very much. Is there anything else we can do for you? I was wondering, Commander, just what would happen to your men up there if something went wrong with your ship. Sir. All right, sir, we'll try and show you. Roland, right. one third of the crew, Bannon right. Sheriff. Aye, sir. Oh. Three engines idle. Aye, sir. Started from San Diego a little over 12 hours ago in a coast to coast race against time. Well, we are getting our money's worth today. Oh, he ought to be roaring along here any minute now. Let me throw Lieutenant Pierce's plane. Aye, aye, sir. Well, talking of windbags, how are you feeling? 
to make a landing. Just watch and see how, how easily he does it. Let's go trail line. Great show, Brady. Great Thank you, show. sir. Mr. Rondell, sorry you went up with it. Thank you. Your ship's a marvelous performer. Not a bit temperamental. No, sir, and what's more, she'll perform that way any place in the world. Even over the Antarctic? Especially over the Antarctic. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Pierce has sighted to westward. Coming this way, too. Looks like it's coming right for me. Boy, if he does that again, he's going to take my tope off. He's broken the record. Well, I suppose I must congratulate you. Mm -hmm. Say hello for me, will you, there? That boy's got more nerve than anybody I ever saw. Jack. Hello, Helen. Hi, didn't I? I'm all right, thanks. Hey, this has been a day, hasn't it? Yes. Gosh, I'll say so. Hey, haven't you had your dinner yet? Where's Frisky? Well, Frisky hasn't come home yet. Well, he's probably been interviewed to death and is now having his back slapped off. You ought to feel pretty proud, Helen. And I've been waiting to do some back slapping myself. Only, how can you slap a back when there isn't any back to slap? Tell me something. Have you been crying? Well, no, Jack, of course not. Don't be silly. Come on, sit down. Do you want a cigarette? Please. Well, we have another cup to add to the collection. I don't think there's room for another, is there? 
departure. We'll make room. That's not a trophy, it's a relic. <laughs> doesn't belong up here. This doesn't represent conquest. Oh, Jack. That represents friendship. Give it to me, Jack. Well, aren't you going to sit down? Winner, first place, Navy Pursuit Plane. Winner, Minneapolis Air Show. Winner, first place, free for all, high speed, Snyder Cup. It's Frisky! Frisky! <laughs> oh, darling, I'm so blessed oh, to see you. Oh, you don't mind the Navy, do you, dear? Of course not. Hello, boys. How do you do? How do you do? Gee, I meant to call you old Navy, dear, but I didn't get a minute. Did I, fellas? No, 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 is this our senior officer talking? Yes, about? sir, and you take orders from me right now. Now, come on, boys. Oh, just well, nice. Don't go no party. It's a great party, boys. Come on, boys. Come on. 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 Why weren't you there? Oh, I know. You were afraid I'd do one of those. Mm-hmm. But I got a surprise for you. It only cost two cents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was printed this morning on the Pacific Coast, and here it is delivered on the Atlantic Coast the same day. There you are. Take a look. Read all about your disgusting, I mean, distinguished <laughs> husband. Say, front page, how about eight or ten seconds of your distinguished time? Well, I might consider it. I've got news. Don't tell me you're going to make a non-stop flight to Coney Island. I'm going to make a non-stop flight to the South Pole. How do you like them for apples? You're going to what? You heard me. And I don't want you to spill it to any of your newspaper pals, because it's no pipe dream. I'm going to the South Pole. Me and my gas bag and Rondell and, uh... And what? And how would you like to go along? Me? The South Pole? Well, what would I do in that sausage of yours? I can land a plane on the dirigible and take off. Uh, how? I'll show you. Well, now look. See? Here's your dirge. And here's the plane. And... Wait a minute. Come on, hurry up. Give me a load of this. You got me I'll all excited. Now listen. Right here. There's the dirigible. Hanging down here, there's a gadget, like a trapeze, see? Oh, I remember. You made a drawing. Yeah. Right? And on the wings of your plane, there's a hook. Now, follow this. Here I am floating along. That's me. This is you. Here you come down like this. Now, you fly along and jockey into such a position as to engage this hook into the trapeze. You get the idea? Oh, I get the idea, all right. Well, it's no sin. I can see that, too. It's like threading a needle. That's why I had you detail the Lakehurst. Well, well, well. Well, what are you laughing about? <laughs> well, I just see myself hanging on to your belly and looking very swell. Oh, listen, you poor <laughs> fish. You'll probably fly over more unexplored territory than we will. We'll send you out on side trips. How does that strike you? Well, I'll consider the matter. Well, listen, big boy. Don't let it get you down or give you a headache or keep you up at night. Because there's 101 pilots that's just dying for this chance. Yeah, well, you just try and keep me away. That a boy. Now, listen. <laughs> you help me put this over, and we're a cinch for the South, South Pole. Well, Rondell won't have an argument left. And by the way, kid, you knocked him into a flat spin when you <laughs> came into this. Does he know I'm going? No, he don't know you're going. But when he finds out, he'll well, be... Why don't you give me a load? I wouldn't give you a load. I've been watching that thing. Have a little drink. Here. Don't bother about Helen. Can I count on you for this? Say, if there's any plane flying over any pole, I'll be there. Atta, sailor. 
And listen, I want to come down tomorrow. Come down in the morning, and I'll show you the whole early. thing. Early, see, I'd like to see how it works out. Helen, I'll, Jack, don't bother, going. Helen. Say goodbye for me, and I'll see you in the morning. Okay, pal. Helen. Helen. I haven't had your dinner yet, have you? Did you read my letter? Letter? Oh. Don't you remember I asked you to read it right after you landed? I didn't forget it, honey. Honest, I didn't. I was thinking about it all the way, but I was mobbed when I came down, and I'll read it now. Sweetheart, thousands are cheering you, but I'm the only one who loves you. Helen. Somebody ought to give me a good swift kick in the pants. <laughs> will you forgive me, sweetheart? Of course you will. You always do. <laughs> you flew through the hangar today, and you promised you wouldn't. Ah, uh, I was just giving the crowd a run for their money. You love the crowd, don't you? Not as much as I love my little wife, though. When you've got a reputation, you've got to live up to it. Even if you have to die for it? Well, you can only die once. Oh, no. You can die a hundred times. I have. Ever since the first time I saw you crash. I know, I know. That time I crashed out in Chicago with that old crate. And every time it whirled on its way down, I died 50. Oh, and darling. And then the awful sound of that crash. But I walked away from it, didn't I? Without a scratch. And wasn't it funny, instead of me passing out, you did. I'll never forget how glad you were to see me when you came to. Fifty, how long have we been married? Well, you know, a couple of years, I guess. It's really only a couple of months. That's all I've seen of you these last two years. Hmm. I'm in the Navy now. I'm not behind. Can I help it if they give me all the tough jobs? Can I help it if some of these fair-weather pilots get seasick every time they go up? Can I? I'd never complain, Fifty. But I couldn't stand it if the next two years are going to be like the last two. Oh, they won't be, sweetheart. Now, I'll never fly through the hangars again. I'll read your letters on the minute, and I'll be home for dinner every night. Give me a kiss, will you? <laughs> And you won't go to any South Pole with Jack Braden. What's that? Oh, Frisky, I couldn't help hearing what you were talking about. And I could just hate Jack for even suggesting it to you. But, dear, that's different. It's science. You wouldn't want me to give up an opportunity like this, the greatest chance in my life, the biggest flight ever attempted? Yes, I would. He could easily get somebody else. Oh, but he can't. That's the point. He asked for me. It means an awful lot to him. You wouldn't want me to turn down a friend like Jack, would you? Then if Jack didn't want you to go, you wouldn't. Absolutely not, sweetheart. Now, come on, let's let's forget it and, and be like we've always been. Not... Mm. Yes. Some guy just made 30 outside loops, did he? <laughs> well, that's nothing. Say, listen, I'll give you a little scoop for that paper of yours. If you want to see a real stunt, come out to the hangar early in the morning. I'm going to hook that plane of mine under that dirigible in flight. Yes, and... Well, I'll see you in the morning. Helen. Good morning, Lieutenant. Oh, good morning, sir. Well, do you think you can make it? You know, the plane will be a great auxiliary to the dirigible on our trip. Auxiliary? Oh, uh, you think the dirigible is the auxiliary, eh? Signal, sir. Yeah. 
Pardon me while I imitate a baby pig hooking onto its mama pig for lunch. Uh, good luck, boy. Good luck. That means we take a plane along. I guess we'll come after all. That's a great step for lighter than air. I tried three times to reach it. The closest I ever got to it was within 200 miles. But in those days, we didn't have any flying machines, nor radio telephones. Just dogs and men. I can believe the men part of it. Ah, thank you, thank you. No, no more, thank you. Well, from Punta Serenas, here at the tip of the South American continent, which you say will be our last stop. Yes, we'll have to refuel there. Yes. Well, from there to the South Pole is a flight of 7,000 miles. That is there and back. When we near the pole, our greatest difficulty comes. Because, um, here, here, maybe this will illustrate it. Yes. You see, the South Pole is in the center of a great ice cap, huge that rises almost abruptly, almost perpendicularly, 10,000 feet above the Antarctic continent. That's our great barrier. Once past that, it's an easy flight of 600 miles. And then you see... We what do you think about it, Clarence? Uh, uh, does you want my personal opinion, sir? Oh, certainly, certainly, yes. Well, gentlemen, I, I couldn't help from listening, especially when I hear you talking about ice jams and pelicans and, and compasses and sextets and mountain ranges. How about some gas ranges? How about some Eatmans? Eatmans? We never gave it a thought. Well, it appears to me while y'all is trying to climb that pole, you ought to have some rations. Yes. Permanent and frequent. How did we happen to overlook that? I can't imagine. Well, sir, that, that's where I come in, sir. You? Yeah. What do you know about the South Pole? Well, wasn't I born south? 
Uh, it ain't Birmingham, so? Oh, yes. Come in. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You better tell these women to lay off. You know, you're in training now. Hmm. Don't you worry about me. Will you pardon me, Mr. Rondell? I'll be back in just a second. going away again. This time it's to the end of the world. Jack, I want you to take Frisky off the trip to the pole. Take Frisky off? But Helen... You I... won't miss him. You have a hundred other pilots to choose from. I heard you say so. I know, but after all... This it... is only a stunt to him, Jack. What'll he lose if he doesn't go? Just a little applause and a few headlines. And those that only make it more difficult for me. Do you think I've been happy all this time? I haven't. I've been absolutely miserable. And if he does go now, I won't be here when he comes back. Take him off it, Jack. Please do that for me. Well, Helen, you know that I'd do anything in the world for you, but... You see, I've pulled every wire in Washington. I could I'm have... I'm sorry. I shouldn't have asked you. I didn't know how important it was. Thanks, Jack. Never mind. Helen, please. Don't, Jack, let me go. Well, I can't let you go this way. Please. I'll see what I can do, Helen. What are you going to do about your family while you're away? Family? Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean my wife? Yes. Ah, uh, she's a million. Fine. You know, I could go away for ten years. When I came back, she'd be waiting for me. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. I've got her trained. Well, that's good. Because, you know, sometimes wives and South Poles don't mix. <laughs> you will do it, won't you? And you won't let Pisky know I asked you. Promise me that, Jack. He'll never know. Jack! I promised you, didn't I? Yes, you promised. All right, I will. Martin, what How am I going to dance with my little wife? <laughs> Say, Frisky, let's go out and smoke a cigarette. Let's have anchors away. Wait a minute. <laughs>
Frisky, you're pretty keen about making this trip to the South Pole, aren't you? Why, certainly, Jack. You should have read the story I gave the papers this morning. Why? Well, I was just thinking. Come on, let's step in the hangar. Say, is this a six-day bicycle race? Say, Jack, why did you ask me if I was anxious to go? Because it'd be easier if you weren't. Easier for what? To tell you that you're not going. I'm not going. Say, for a minute, boy, you had me winging. Come on, what's the gag? When do I laugh? I hate to tell you this, Frisky, but I want you to withdraw from the flight. Withdraw? Why, Jack, you asked for me, didn't you? Yes, I did. But I changed my mind. Why? I can't give you any explanation. I want you to do it as a favor to me. Why, well, you're crazy, Jack. I can't do that now. People would think I was yellow. Besides, the newspapers are... Oh, listen. No, they won't. After all the glory that you won this year, who would think you were yellow? Glory? Yeah. Oh, I'm just beginning to get it for the first time. You're afraid I'll steal your show. You don't want anybody else to get any of the glory. Well? That's as good as any. Okay. We let it go at that. After all, it was my original idea in the first place, wasn't it? Yes, it was your idea, but it's my reputation. And I'm not going to withdraw for anybody. And I'll have to go to the Admiral. Yeah, what can you tell the Admiral? I can tell him plenty. In the first place, I ordered you not to stunt when you made the hook on. But you disobeyed that order. This trip to the South Pole isn't an exhibition. It's a job. There'll be no crowds down there for you to play to. Frisky, you're a grandstand. What I need is a pilot. Now, do I have to go to the Admiral, or will you step up? That's a very pretty speech. OK, I'll step up. But get this in your head. Whatever Frisky Pierce starts, he finishes. I'm going to the South Pole, whether you like it or not, if I have to crawl on my hands and knees. And if I don't get there before you do, you can bet your neck I'll arrive in time to pick up your pieces. My pal.
by a fair weather flyer? Actually, they must know if we're in distress, sir. What do you mean in distress? Of course we're not in distress. Aye, sir. Better go along. See how our covering's holding. Aye, sir. How's our altitude? Ship's getting heavy, sir. How much balance have we left, Roland? All over, Walter.
Hard luck, Braden. That's not your arm. No, sir, I'm all right. Some of my boys there need looking after. Yeah, I'll take care of them, all right. How do you do, Mr. Rondell? How do you do, sir? I just received word from Washington you to proceed there by air immediately if you're able to travel. Aye, aye, sir. That's tough, Jack. Thank you, Pete. Mr. Rondell, how do you do? There's your plane waiting for you, Braden. Aye, aye, sir. Sailing orders? Oh, I'm not taking orders anymore. This is my leave of absence, breaking your hearts. I'm a civilian now. No kidding. No wisecracks. I'm a very important gent. I got a half interest in the South Pole expedition. Yeah, who's the other half? Rondell. No! When are you leaving? As soon as I can get enough money together, I'll outfit our boat with. You've no idea how much money it takes to be an explorer. I'm in hot now up to my neck, <laughs> and I may have to pawn some of my wife's jewels. Say, Frisky. What the devil are you going to all this trouble to reach the South Pole for? Yeah. Well, there's an old friend of mine that'll be very delighted to hear about it. That's all. Well, so long, Well, Chase. good luck for some work. Skip the gutter. <laughs> Frisky. Yeah? I didn't think I'd have a chance to see you before you left. I sure hope you'll make it. Thanks. I wouldn't disappoint you for the world. Of course, there won't be any crowds down there to play to. Tough break for a grandstander. But watch the papers. It may leak out and get in the headlines anyway. We're depending completely on the plane this time. Yes. Hello, hello, Christian. Well, all set? All set. Fine. coming out of the boat with us? Nearly everybody in New York is at of that boat. Of course she is. Fine. You promised you wouldn't make me go down there. Oh, I know, but... Uh... Please, just, you know, I'll just be in the way. What's this? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, I won't be the last one to see my husband off, but I do want to be the very first one to congratulate him. <laughs> Look, folks, it says not to be open until you've reached the South Pole. <laughs> <laughs> My little optimist, and I won't forget to read it either. You'll remind him, won't you, Mr. Ryan? <laughs> you bet I will. And now, really, we must say goodbye. Goodbye. Good luck. Thank Listen, you. folks, let's all go down the boat and frisky off. Oh, oh, Sweetheart, I'm going to keep this right here. And I'll read it as soon as I get there. Oh, don't go, sister. I don't want you to go. Please, listen. 
We could just go out the back door and they wouldn't know anything about us. Oh, Frisky, I want you to sweetheart. You're not going to act like this. Why, you've been great up until now. You... Come on now, sweetheart. I've got to hurry. Come on, now, give me a smile. Give me a smile. Come on, will you give me one of those big smiles? Come on. Come on. That's it. Come on, a little more. Let her go. That's the girl. Ah. Oh. Ah, oh, yes, sweetheart. What the biggest kick I'll get out of going to South Pole is coming back to you, dear. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. That song you sing gives me the creeps. Sing it again, will you, Clarence? You know, you haven't heard a word I've been saying. Yes, I have. What did I say? You told me there was something wonderful you wanted to show me tomorrow. What is it? It's the Los Angeles, my new ship. It's here and ready for the first flight. I'll be there, Jack. Well, I promise you one thing. You won't be bored. It's the finest ship of its kind ever built. I don't know about that. But there's one thing I am sure of. It has the finest commander in the world. 
Say, I always cracked like that out of you, and I'll bury you in the sand. <laughs> what do you say if we go down and see it this afternoon? Thanks, Jack. But I'd rather loaf here with you. What are you dreaming about? Uh, snow and ice. Lonely? Not a bit. How could I be lonely with you here? Jack. Yes? If I should start swimming in a straight line from here, I'd land in Paris, wouldn't I? Yes, but why Paris? That's where they go to get divorces, isn't it? Emergency rations. Ten boxes. Yeah, chicky. Not so well, bad. Sir. All set, Lieutenant? Rare to go. Fine, got everything. I forgot something. Uh -huh. I'll be right uh -huh. back. Hey, Frisky, take one for me. <laughs> <laughs> he forgot his pilot's license. have complete charge of the base until we return. We'll keep in constant touch with the radio, relay all of our messages north. Yes, sir. We expect to return within 20 hours. If not, we will pack everything at once and move it aboard the ship. We will have to sail in 12 days to avoid being frozen in for the winter. Under no circumstances are you to send a relief party to the south. We are fully equipped to make our way back here alone. The boat must sail in 12 days. Is that distinctly understood? Yes, sir. Well, see you soon, Lieutenant. Good luck, sir. Good luck. Well, Goodbye, boys. Goodbye, boys. Goodbye. 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 Say, we're sure to have a room. I wired ahead for reservations. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Stubb, right, Mr. Yeah. Stubb, can I speak to you a minute private? All right, honey. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You don't mean to say that you want to come along with us? Oh, no, sir, Mr. Stubb. I have ambitions, but I ain't crazy. But, Mr. Stubb, I want you to take Lady Luck along with you. Now, Mr. Stubb, here is a rabbit foot that came off a lady rabbit. If it takes that along with you, you not only flies over that pole, but you bring that pole right on back here with you. Thanks, Clarence. <laughs> Give it 
in this part of the world, but in the South Pole Plain, it's high noon. Their last message gave their altitude at 7,000 feet. They are now approaching the great Antarctic ice barrier, an almost vertical wall of ice 11,000 feet high. 7-Eleven, lucky numbers for Frisky Pierce. He's fighting for altitude. If they get over the barrier, the rest is easy. They'll plant all glory in the center of thousands of miles of country, never before seen by mortal man. They're all alone down there. But millions are wishing them luck. In a little while now, they'll be going over the top. Stand by for further announcements. In the meantime, George DeBurn and his Hotel Marsh Orchestra will entertain you. Don't let him get to South Pole. Don't let him get there. Bring him back safe. They made it. They're over the pole. Stand by, folks. Great news. The plane has reached the South Pole. Another thrilling achievement has been added to the list of great American exploits. Their last message says they're not merely satisfied with just getting there. They're going to look around. I know that Frisky's beautiful young wife must be listening in. 
Mrs. Pierce, every wife in the world is envying you at this moment when your husband is winning fame and glory in the midst of a vast desert of ice. Mrs. Well, Trisky has put it over again. Allow me to congratulate you, Helen. Oh, don't congratulate me, Jack. Help me. I want to get away from here. I want to go to Paris to get my divorce. Take it easy now, Helen. Have you thought this all out? Thought of it? It's all I've been doing for weeks. I have to go, Jack. I have to go now. But if you go to Paris, I'm coming after you. I want you to. I want you to be there when I'm free. Helen, I don't have to tell you that I love you, that I always have loved you. You know that. I'll wait for you no matter how long it is, if you want me to.
Does your leg feel better in that position, sir? Well, I can't feel anything in that leg at all, for she. Now, you mustn't get to blame on yourself too much for this risky. I wanted to land just as much as you did. I've been 40 years trying to put that there. I'm satisfied. Yeah? Well, I won't be satisfied till I get you fellas back to base. How fast can we travel on this ice? Fast? <laughs> You'll be lucky to average 12 miles a day. That means 90 days. I'll have this set up by that time. One of you come out here and crank this thing. I think I can get a message through. Hey, Sark, go over and give him a hand there with the generator. There, send that. Be careful of that foot, Sark. Getting something. Is it handsome? Come in. What boat do I leave on, Jack? Couldn't you get any tickets? It's all right, Jack. It's what I've expected. He's hurt. He must be badly hurt. What can I do? You love Frisky, don't you? No, no, it isn't that. But he's freezing. He's out there dying. Yes, you do love him. Oh, Jack, don't say that. There'll never be anything ever again between us. But Jack... He needs me. I'll know how to help him. Jack, how can I get there? You know, tell me. How can I get there? Hurry up, stop it. Come on, boys. I hate to leave those fellas down here. Give me a crack at it, Lieutenant. I think I can reach him. Did you think if there was a chance of getting to them that I wouldn't have been the first one to go? Now stop arguing and get this sled out of here. All you got down there, boys? All those bags come in the What's the matter, kid? Leave me alone, will you? You know what's the matter. Listen, I'm not yellow and I'm not afraid to die. Well, nobody's going to die. See, I won't let them. I'll get you all back if I have to drag you back on a sled, see? Oh, yeah? Yeah. 
Now that that's settled, let's eat. Light me a cigarette, will you? So well, sir. A little bit damp. It's all right. Thank you. Frisky. Watch your compass. Don't trust to your senses. And if your food gives out, boil the sealskin on your clothes. Take care of Sock's foot. It looks very bad. Yeah. You only made nine miles today. Tomorrow you will do better. The sled will be lighter. Oh, now don't talk like that, Skipper. We're going to get you back. Why, well, you live to write a book about it. And when you do, don't forget one detail. The sap named Pierce got you into this jam because he wanted to show off. Oh, forget it. I know, I know. But do you realize that the failure of the Los Angeles would mean the utter abolishment of lighter than air? Yes, sir. But you must also realize the success of the Los Angeles puts lighter than air over the top. Confound it, we may be sending 30 men to their death. Besides yourself. We're not sending anybody. I promise you I'll take nobody but volunteers. It would be marvelous. It would be marvelous. But it's too big a risk. Forget it, Brayton. Forget it. This ship, sir, can do anything. Besides that, I have four other good reasons why the Los Angeles must fly to the South Pole. What are they? Rondell, Pierce, McGuire, and Hanson. Four men facing certain death on the ice today, with nothing but a miracle to save them. And that miracle is waiting in the hangar at Lakehurst. We can't let men like that die, sir. The world needs their type. By Jove, it's, it's a 20 to 1 chance. Well, Skipper, another day, another dollar. A million days, a million dollars. Let's not go, Hanson. Oh, boy, it's cold, isn't it? Yeah. It always is. Let me find them. <laughs> and a cigarette, Skipper? Skipper! Skipper! Skipper, you can't do that! All right, that's enough, fellas.
fight for the old friend of Gulliver's. Very well, take your post. I've just received orders from Washington to take the Los Angeles to the rescue of the Rondell expedition. You know what this flight means. You know what happened to the Pensacola. The Los Angeles will probably experience weather conditions far worse than the Pensacola's ever seen. We may come back, we may not. I'm calling for volunteers. All those that want to make this flight, take two paces to the front. Thank you, man. I'm sorry I can't take you all. Well, true. True, take these names. Murphy, Reitzman, Paddock, Rosenberg. What's the matter, sock old kid? I, I, I know I'm an awful baby, but my foot killing me. Oh, oh, oh. I, I'm not a baby, Frisky, but I can't help it. Oh, God. Oh, oh, oh. Wait a minute, I'll see what I can do, kid. I don't want to cry, but I can't. Oh, oh, oh. I've been holding out on you, boys. If you look in my side pocket, you'll find some real food. You've got what? Go on, look. Ah, uh, what are you talking about? Look. It's 
throw that in. We'll make a Welch rabbit out of it. How many more miles? Hanson, will you write that down? I can't see very well. Snow blind, huh? We made seven miles today. That makes 176, all told. Oh, we gotta do better than that tomorrow. I wonder how far it is from here to San Diego. There was a little dame down there. And don't tell me there was a gal in San Diego. And what a dame. I was walking along the street like, and she comes along and says, hello, sailor. And I says, hello. That was a snappy comeback. And we were standing in front of a moving picture theater, so I says, what about seeing the show? And she says, yes, yeah, so, so we go in. And after the show, he's walking down the street, and I kind of seen she wanted a soda, so I, I up and buys her one. That makes 70 cents she spent so far. And after the show, she says she has a player piano, and would I like to hear some rolls? So I went up to her house. You know, she was living with some girl that was in Los Angeles for the weekend. Well, it was a nice place, nice and flat, and sort of cozy-like, sort of silk stuff all around. We played the piano for a while, and I seen she was kind of tired and wanted to go to bed, so I picked up my hat and told her I ought to be getting back. Right. You know, she she was kind of sorry to see me go. I could tell that by her face. But anyways, I went out and started back to the station. And all the way back, I couldn't help thinking that if I'd have worked it right, I could have kissed that gal.
the left, Risky. To the right, straight ahead. Which way, Hanson? Straight ahead, Risky. To the right, in the crevice. Get to the right. To the right, let's keep We're back! We're back! Hanson! Come on now. Don't go to sleep. Don't go to sleep. Come on, old timer. Listen, I know what this food. Food, do you hear me? Food! Come on, I can get you out of this. But you gotta show me the way. In my eyes, you understand me? You gotta show me the way. Come on, now get up. Damn you! I'm gonna get you back! If I don't get anyone else, I'll get you! Wake up! Wake up, I tell you! You're not going to sleep, you hear me? Wake up! Come on, I'm gonna get you back! You're the only one, but I'll get you back! Yes? Two bodies sighted, sir. 25 degrees to the starboard, sir. Are they alive? Not moving, eh? 25 degrees to the starboard. Uh, All engines full speed ahead. Aye, aye. Everybody keep a sharp lookout. Mr. Rollins, get your parachute plane ready. Aye. Something black against the ice, sir. Where? Two-point starboard. Three engines idle, two engines high speed. Aye, aye, sir. Parachute man, stand by to bail out. There they are now. I'm going to get his feet. I only see two. All right, parachute man, bail out. Aye, aye, sir.
Howard Spritzky, Doctor. Fine, Commander. All right, Sam. He's still on liquid diet, but go right in. Well, I'll only be there in a minute. Who is it? Braden. Oh, hello, Blimpo. <laughs> hello, front face. Front face, nothing. I'd have made the death count if it hadn't been for you. There, there, Admiral. How is Helen? Oh, she'll be all right as soon as you get back. Did she send any message? Well, I've all let them go. Jack, will you look in my clothes? In, uh, in the shirt pocket, there's a, there's a letter, I'm sure. Did you find it? Yeah, I guess this is it. To be open after you've reached the South Pole. Thanks. Forget all about it. Boy. I'm still as blind as a bat. I can't see anything. Will you read it for me? Sure, I will. Well, here it goes. Stranger in the family, you know. Come on, read it, will ya? Sweetheart, you won the greatest triumph of your life. What can I say to make it any greater? Only this, that I love and adore you, and hope and pray that you come home safe to your Helen. Gee, that's great. Give it to me, Jack. Well, let me keep it, Frisky. You might lose it. No, I can take care of it. Can you beat that? Well, the wind blew it right out of my hand. I'm sorry, Frisky. Oh, that's all right. I can remember every word of it. Sweetheart, you've won the greatest triumph of your life. What can I say to make it any greater? Only this. One of New York's biggest welcomes. Here we are now in front of the city hall, waiting for the parade to start, and millions of people are waiting. Where is Lieutenant Pitt? I don't know, sir. I was driving him here when he jumped out of the car and disappeared in the crowd. We looked for him, but we couldn't find him, sir. Let's start the parade already. All right, boys, let's go. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Amanda, would you mind sitting up here where they can see you? Enough. I'll never go away again as long as I live, David. Even after my letter? Oh, what a letter. I couldn't read it. I was snow blind. But Jack read it to me. But I remember everything that was there. You want to hear it? Listen, sweetheart, this is your greatest plan. What can I say to make it great? Only this, that I love you and adore you, and I want you to come back soon to your home. Was well, that it? Jack read it to me. Sure he did. But old Butterfingers dropped it. And blew out of his hand. Oh, oh, oh. What's the matter? What are you laughing at? Because I'm so happy. What are you crying about? Because I'm so happy. Well, I have to tell you, those snowy South Pole scenes were actually shot in Southern California, 
during a September heat wave. They used thousands of tons of bleached cornflakes to look like Antarctic snow. The actors had paraffin painted on their faces to simulate frost, but the biggest challenge, said the director Frank Capra, was finding a way to have the actor's breath be visible, as it would be in such weather. What he did was give the actors small metal cages filled with dry ice that they had to hold in their mouths. Well, indeed, their breath showed up, but they couldn't say their lines with that contraption in their mouths. Well, in frustration, one actor, Hobart Bosworth, who played Rondell, threw the cage away, and before anybody could stop him, he put the dry ice directly into his mouth. Bad idea. He was soon screaming in agony and wound up losing five teeth and part of his jawbone and some soft tissue. Though remarkably, after a few months, he was able to speak again. In other words, don't put ever dry ice in your mouth, even if a director tells you to. Up next, Faye Ray and Joel McRae are running for their lives as a hunter uses them for target practice. Tonight on Turner Classic Movies, a shipwrecked Faye Ray joins the most dangerous game. And Gregory Peck is after a designing woman. And fugitive Humphrey Bogart takes a dark passage. TCM keeps the midnight oil burning. One child out of every 150 had some form of autism. And the economic cost? About $35 billion per year. While there's really no cure for autism, autism, excuse me, once you meet Amanda Bags, you will see there is much hope. She lives in a small town in Vermont, but thanks to the internet, she's now known around the world. Here's our chief medical correspondent on this extraordinary journey, finding Amanda. <laughs> This is Amanda Bags, rocking back and forth. She does not make eye contact, her movements erratic, her behavior eccentric. She cannot speak, and for most of us, this is precisely what we expect when we see a person with autism. But Amanda and her friends will absolutely change your expectations. Would you define yourself as an autistic person, Amanda? Yes, the word for people whose brains look like my last I checked. As you'll see, Amanda has a lot to say. Her brilliance is laced with a wry sense of humor. We first came across Amanda on YouTube. Her appearance there is so startling, I wanted to meet her. I had so many questions. The way I naturally think and respond to things looks and feels so different from standard concepts or even visualization that some people do not consider it thought at all. It is only when I type something in your language that you refer to me as having communication. Amanda calls herself bilingual. For other autistic people, she has movements and gestures to communicate. But for the rest of us, she made this video to teach us how it works. She calls us neurotypical, meaning we do not have autism. She communicates with a keyboard and her computer, and for visitors, a voice synthesizer. So you've seen the video. Well, I wanted to meet the person who actually made this video to better understand. Her name is Amanda Bagg. She lives right here, and she lives alone. This is where Amanda made the video. She shot it, edited, and posted it on the internet. All completely on her own. Surprised? After all, some medical professionals have labeled her a low-functioning autistic. 
part of the reason people watched it were, was because they were so stunned that a person who carries this label of autism, who doesn't speak, could put together such an astonishing video. I put together several videos before and not a lot of people watched them. But this time, she got through. Amanda, when you hear about people with autism that are institutionalized, that, that no one has really ever made a, a concerted effort to try and reach out to, to communicate with in some way, what do you say to, what do you say to those people? Everyone interacts with their society. If someone is shut off from interacting with society, then someone else is shutting it off because it sure doesn't seem to me that I've ever seen someone who doesn't interact with society. Amanda will be our guide to her world with all its wonder and all of its frustration. <laughs> When Amanda hit herself, I was startled, but not surprised. It's a familiar autistic behavior. She must be so frustrated, such a bright woman, so trapped. And yet I wondered, how is it that Amanda has been able to reveal so much about herself and her autism? She relies on the internet. It's her connection to other autistics. There, she can talk, think, and feel on her own terms. I meet an autistic boy who has written and published part of a book. Was it difficult for you to learn how to read? My first language was gestures. In so many ways, Amanda is an inspiration to him. Amanda is our guide on a startling journey across the continent and into a world we've made so little effort to understand. When we come back, Sanjay's first stop on this amazing journey. He'll introduce us to an autistic boy who met Amanda Bags online and now looks to her as a role model. DJ's story is next when Finding Amanda continues. I've been waiting for so long now.